today we're, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Malena Rangeloff, and uh, Malena is a visiting Sustainable Pavements Research Associate from the National and the National Academy of Sciences postdoctoral fellow, uh, working at the Federal Highway Administration. And uh, Malena did her undergraduate work at the University of Belgrade, and her doctorate at Washington State, and she's focused on uh, materials durability and characterization. And uh, she's one of our main gurus at Federal Highways on life cycle assessment. Welcome, Elena. Thank you, John. And thank you all for coming. So, John, again, thanks for having me. This is very exciting. Uh, so, a uh, little bit, John mentioned a little bit about my background. Right now, I work in Federal Highway Administration as a postdoc. And Federal Highway has this. Uh, hub for research called Turner Fairbank Research Center, and that's where most of the postdocs are. Labs and like modeling, all these kinds of things, but I am a weirdo because I work in headquarters, so I'm more involved on in the end of the policy and regulation, uh, all these kinds of things. And I thought this would be a very interesting presentation for you guys because you come from diverse uh, types of backgrounds, so it will have a little bit of engineering, a little bit of policy, a little bit of uh, big system thinking, a little bit of politics. <laughs> and uh, as a federal, uh, working in a federal entity, what we do a lot in headquarters especially is we're trying to uh, kind of be on the edge of the trends that are coming up. As you know, in the U.S., states have a lot of freedom to do things that they want. There is some federal requirements. Uh, but there is a lot of diverse practices and a lot of diverse things that are being implemented. So we're kind of trying to follow all of that and also to monitor things that are coming from the higher up, from the Senate, different types of policies and legislations that are trying to be introduced and kind of give our technical perspective. So that's what we're doing. We are, I'm working on sustainable pavement program and we collaborate a lot with stakeholders. That's very important for us. We have a lot of stakeholders and we're doing the hard work of trying to make all of them happy, not easy. So. Uh, this is the list of acronyms, and yes, my presentation is titled Integration of Life Cycle Assessment into Planning and Pavement Design. So we know that sustainability has three components, environmental, economic, and social. So I'm talking about life cycle assessment here, which is the environmental component. Uh, that doesn't mean to other ones are less important. Social is outside of the scope of this research. So we'll focus on environmental and we'll mention economic components through life cycle cost analysis uh, every now and then. So um, in the work of agencies, environmental impacts are typically introduced through planning. So on planning level, big picture thinking, that's mostly when environmental impacts are being considered. There is also this federal requirement that's called NEPA analysis. NEPA stands for National Environmental Policy Act. So for some of the projects, uh, these different uh, permitting types are being done. Uh, but uh, now also what is happening, and you guys are in California, California is kind of leading the way in this. Many states have their own environmental goals. So it could be impact reductions to this level up to, you know, uh, until 2050, et cetera. So we talked about uh, California has something like that. Minnesota has something like that. Washington, Oregon, New York. So like these larger metropolitan areas sometimes also have that on a city level. What we have concluded when we talk to our stakeholders is that these policies don't have feet, if you will. That means if you do good jobs, gold star for you. If you don't do good jobs, nothing happens. So that's a little troublesome because that doesn't, that means there is no accountability. There's no feedback loop. So can we really ensure that policies like this stay uh, in implementation and that stakeholders are motivated to pursue them. Another thing is quantification. So what are you measuring? What are you quantifying? How do you know that you have achieved that reduction? That's a very big and important question. Uh, what we have seen recently, so agencies mostly track traffic, uh, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, Summer and I talked about that in the lunch break. So that's something that's being routinely considered when we talk about environmental impact. But it's also acknowledged that there is embodied emissions in our materials, in our pavements. And if we want to pursue these ambitious environmental goals, we need to find multiple places where we can introduce some of the environmental savings. And that's the whole EPD thing with California. 
uh, that California has started, and we'll talk more about that as we go. So basically, we need to find a way to track the impact and to find multiple opportunities to make these reductions. I think these are key takeaways. Uh, life cycle assessment is the method for tracking and evaluating in quantitative form environmental impacts of products and processes. Life cycle assessment is useful and can be used for many different things, many different product systems. Uh, for now, uh, mostly in the transportation infrastructure, it's being done more as a research, and Dr. Harvey's group has done a lot of work in that area, but currently it's not routinely used by any state DOT to measure or track anything that they're doing. So uh, in this study, we wanted to see how LCA can fit the best into planning and project delivery phases. Also, how can it help support these environmental goals and just help people on different levels make better decisions. And we'll talk a little more about TPDs at the end. So life cycle assessment, as I mentioned, is a technique to quantify environmental impacts of products and processes. Ideally, life cycle assessment as a name uh, implies that we should consider the whole life cycle. If we limit ourselves to just one or two phases, maybe we're doing good job there, but we are not seeing some of the trade-offs that can happen down the line. So uh, life cycle assessment covers the range of environmental impacts. We have resources, energy use, creation of waste, and different types of emissions. So in this slide, I'm showing very generic product system. This could be anything. So we're starting with raw material acquisition. We're processing those materials. We're manufacturing our products. Product is in use. And then it reaches the end of life, where we recycle it, get rid of it, dispose of it, et cetera. So these are life cycle phases. Uh, in every one of these phases, we have certain inputs into the system and certain outputs outside of the system. In terms of inputs, we have materials and energy, and in terms of outputs, we have waste and emissions, and also products that we're moving down the supply chain. So basically, when we do life cycle assessment, we do systematic accounting and tracking of everything that goes into the system and everything that comes out of the system. So once you build a system like that, you end up with a list of hundreds of chemicals that is the output, of course, that's difficult to interpret. So for that reason, we are using life cycle impact assessment models to convert this list of chemicals into different environmental potentials, such as global warming potential, ozone depletion potential, et cetera. We'll talk more about that. Uh, note that these are potentials. It doesn't mean for sure that these impacts will happen. However, there is a potential for certain amount of global warming or certain amount of acidification. Just keep in mind that there is an uncertainty element there. So here are the four phases of life cycle assessment. First one is goal and scope. We decide what we want to study and why, what are the questions we're trying to answer. And then based on that, because life cycle assessment is flexible, what kind of methodology is best suited to support that, uh, to answer your question. And then uh, step two is inventory analysis. That's basically the analysis of all of the inputs and outputs that I mentioned. Lastly, we have uh, step three, we have impact assessment. We are converting that large list of chemicals into potentials. And lastly, we are interpreting the results to inform our goal and scope. So this process is iterative and we can go back and forth and basically try to get the question we asked ourselves at the beginning. So four key questions that I have identified here. First one is why, why are you doing the analysis? If you want uh, results of LCA to in influence decision on some level, uh, what's the decision? How are you trying to inform it? Uh, second question is how. So what's the LCA methodology specific framework that will support your, what you're trying to do? Third big question, we will emphasize this over and over, is data. LCA is simple framework, but what's most difficult is collecting all the data and having good and reliable data. And uh, because it's so data intense, the quality of your conclusions will be just as good as your data. Garbage in, garbage out principle. Lastly, who? Who is the stakeholder that is going to interpret uh, these results? And who are you targeting to 
uh, basically make decisions, whose decision are you trying to inform? So key stakeholders are also important. And again, this will be tied to the first question, why, what's the goal and the scope of the study? So having these questions in mind, we asked a group of stakeholders on how they envision uh, life cycle assessment fitting into their practices uh, in transportation decision making. So we had a two day workshop in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we were working with six state DOTs. So we had uh, Caltrans, California, we had Minnesota, we had Iowa, Texas, Washington, and New York. Uh, this, uh, the reason why we chose these DOTs is because they have invested previously into a tool uh, called ICE for the tracking of greenhouse gases. So uh, we kind of consider that because of that, they are somewhat interested into this subject. Uh, but also they are kind of geographically diverse and also some states like California, they have a lot of leadership and a lot of research in this area, some states not so much. So we kind of had a different flavors and different takes on similar things. We had one representative from pavement design and one who was planning or environmental specialist. First thing that we noticed is that these two people did not know each other. Uh, that kind of illustrates somewhat siloed mode of operation that from can be present. From the same DOT they did from each other. Yes, from the same DOT, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's something we will come back to again when we talk more about data and data transfer. I think uh, these types of environmental tracking and just like building these large systems, we need to kind of push and break down these silos and just like make people talk to each other who didn't necessarily talk to each other historically. Uh, the goal of this was to outline current planning and project delivery process and see what state DOTs need, what questions are they interested to answer, and how do we make something that fits their needs. And this is similar to like tech principle of customer development. What we often do as engineers is lock ourselves in a cave, and I'm guilty of that as much as anybody else. Uh, to kind of make this amazing code and build this amazing tool and just like bring it to the world and then you realize people don't want it, it doesn't align with their needs. It's very important to talk to stakeholders and ask these questions before you build something because otherwise you can waste the effort. So for some of the tech initiatives, they have strong feedback loop, but for us, for instance, maybe it's not that fast so we uh, can end up wasting our precious time and effort. So here is the uh, project delivery process we were able to outline. So please note for the beginning that it's circular. So we are, let me go here. It's circular. So we are starting, oops. Okay, I was afraid this is gonna happen. Okay, so okay, let's start up top. I'm showing long range plan. So that's the broadest category. Uh, and then we are going into programming phase or steps. So in these two phases, we are just planning. We're just creating different types of wish lists for the projects or improvements in the transportation systems we want to see. Here is when we decide on the specific project. What are we trying to build? And we have different types of analysis that accompany project development. Then we are sending the project for bidding. Um, and then project is being built. That's construction phase. But this is not the end, if you will, this is just the beginning because this is where our pavement asset gets built and then it goes into the use phase. So we have traffic operations, that's the intended use of the pavement. We have different types of preservation treatments, maintenance and rehabilitation to restore good conditions and good performance. And all of that is monitored through asset management and performance management uh, programs in the state DOT. So that's a powerful source of data and information that's then feeding back into all of these other phases. So based on current state of your uh, infrastructure, you will inform what has to be planned or developed next. So let's say a little bit about each one of these phases. So long range plan is the broadest, and just one more thing, uh, these upper phases like planning and programming, that's where we have highest level of uncertainty. Uh, it's, but we can make many different decisions. Things are way more open-ended. And then as we move down the line, decisions are narrowing down and we don't have as much wiggle room, but we have better data because we know what we're gonna do. So in long range plan, that's 20 year multimodal transportation plan. Again, 20 years is a long period. And 
here is our four questions. Basically, uh, it's, uh, this process is done by state DOCs as well as metropolitan planning organizations. And uh, they are kind of trying to see what's their general direction for uh, their transportation system. Do they want to uh, write the policies that will guide the decisions in the future? What are they considering? Uh, how do they want to see their transportation system evolve in the future? So there is many ways to approach this. I wish I can tell you there is one, two, three, A, B, C type of thing. There's not. Uh, it's more fluffy. It's more open-ended. So some agencies say, oh, we, in the future, we want this. So they're very future-oriented. Some agencies are more present needs oriented. Some say, oh, we don't have enough funding, so let's build the best things we can with money that we have right now. But one trend that we have seen and that's becoming the part of federal requirements is performance-based transportation systems. So they want you to measure and monitor the performance of your system in different domains. And based on that, set your targets for the future and uh, decide on your project so that you can bridge the gap between the two. So that's kind of becoming more of a trend. Uh, so in that state, we have some information on cost, we have some information on budget, uh, current conditions, etc. some traffic data, but like it's more open-ended, more big picture. And then second phase is programming or SIP. SIP stands for Statewide Transportation Improvement Program. So state does one portion of things, MPOs do a portion of work in metropolitan areas, in big cities, and these two are merged together into six. It's four years and it's fiscally constrained, so we have much better idea about the budget. Um, we are deciding on allocations of the funds. We are finally talking about projects. In long-range plan, there are no projects, they're just ideas. Uh, we have projects, projects are being scoped, prioritized. Uh, some agencies have project scoring tools, uh, they are kind of evaluating what happens if you invest here, what happens if you invest there, how much are you going to improve your transportation system if you build an extra lane here, etc. So we have more accurate pavement performance data, annual traffic data, congestion, budget, etc. So we have much better idea. And again, we have this list of projects that are going to be prioritized for four years. Uh, based on what agencies told us, projects that end in SIP usually get built as well. So uh, they kind of go through that list. Uh, once we decide on project, there is many elements of project development. There is geometric design, right of the way, this and that and the other. Here we're going to talk about NEPA because that's the only phase that uh, has something to do with environmental impact and about pavement design because we are uh, sustainable pavement. So, uh, NEPA is process of environmental reviewing and environmental permitting. So uh, it's done by environmental specialists and they are considering land use, they are considering ecosystem disturbance, uh, wetlands, marshlands, uh, forests, etc. So for larger projects that are supposed to have larger impacts on the ecosystem, they do a larger document that's called environmental impact statement, EIS. For smaller projects with lower environmental impact or lower expected environmental disturbance, uh, they do environmental assessment. What I learned recently is that there is a whole category of projects that fall under categorical exclusion. Uh, and many of uh, paving or let's, let's say maintenance overlaying projects because there is no alteration in their land use automatically fall under categorical exclusion. So NEPA is not done for everything, and there is certainly projects that fall under the radar. Uh, states are required to do NEPA, but they can largely choose whatever they think is appropriate to report. Some states report greenhouse gases for NEPA, other states don't. Again, it depends on the project, so there is a big variety in what's being done. Project development phase includes pavement design and analysis, and that's something we care about. Uh, so in this phase, we have district or state DOT pavement engineers, uh, and they have the inputs on traffic, some of the project-specific data, what's the soil, they know exact location. They have much clearer information about how they're going to they're, they're going to use to design their pavement. So if you took pavement design class, you're doing essentially that. So you have all of these inputs and you're kind of trying to come up with layers and uh, some preliminary material choice uh, for your pavement. 
what we learned from different agencies is that most of them also do life cycle cost analysis in this space, and sometimes that's being used uh, just to be recorded and just to have that in the archive, and sometimes that's used for the pavement design selection or pavement type selection. Uh, next phase is bidding, and here we are assuming that we have design bid build contract mechanism. There is other types of contract mechanism, such as design build, uh, but this one is very common and because it's uh, very relevant to California's initiative at ETDs, we decided to focus on that. So the goal of this phase is to award successful bidder. Successful bidder will know the details of the project and will have much clearer data. They know exactly cost schedules, plans, what specifications they're going to follow that's set by DOTs. And, uh, the goal here is to identify best value bid or the lowest value bid because oftentimes we function in the low bid environment. So uh, this is done by financial management people, uh, legal department in DOTs, and of course contractors are the ones participating. Uh, when successful contractor gets the project, uh, here comes the construction phase. And this is where everything is crystal clear. They know what uh, basically what they are doing. So we have specific mix designs selected. We know exactly how much machines worked, uh, what did we do, what were the traffic detours, what was the congestion, what was this, what was that. So we have a very clear idea of what has happened in the field. We have contractors doing all these work, but state DOTs oversees these projects for the quality control and assurance. Again, construction is not the end, but rather just the beginning. Uh, it's followed by use phase. We're monitoring performance. We're maintaining the asset. We're doing what we need to do uh, until it reaches the end of life when we decide what to do next. Uh, so we were thinking about what's the potential LCA fit based on what our stakeholders told us. So in the long-range planning, when we have this biggest picture, uh, we thought there is a good use of consequential LCA. We have identified one type of LCA for each phase. It doesn't mean other types wouldn't be useful. Uh, of course, there is many more possibilities, but this is just what we thought would be most applicable. Consequential LCA is a specific type of LCA where we make a big change in the system and then see how the system reacts to it. So for instance, we make a policy always to put ground tire rubber in total payment. What happens to the asphalt we would use otherwise? What happens to, you know, cement kilns that use those ground tire rubber for the fuel, for instance, and something like that? Uh, it's challenging because we need to make a lot of assumptions about how the system is going to react, and we don't know. So that's, I think, the trickiest part. That's why we think it probably would be outsourced to LCA consultants or researchers if the DOT is about to do that. But uh, that's the broad scale type of analysis that can inform the policy. Uh, readiness level is medium. Again, we need a large industry, large scale industry sector data to support this. And again, our assumptions are, are always vulnerable and there is uncertainty there. Next phase is step or programming. So in this stage, we saw that attributional network level LCA would be the most applicable. So uh, that would help agencies first inform their project prioritization, and second, uh, also uh, provide for the environmental disclosure, basically benchmark the whole system and see how well they're doing and if they're making the progress towards the environmental goals they were hoping to make. Uh, we would use regional or state average data, historical data, et cetera. Right now, as, as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there is no network level tool developed specifically for agencies, or you guys are working on that. We've, impl <clears throat> we've implemented it in Caltrans. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll but it's not specific. It's, it's uh, how you set up the benefits inside the payment management system. You set up a greenhouse gas benefit. Yes, yes. So that's, yeah, but I think there is no like commercial or any other development of these tools. So that's kind of a tricky part. Also, you need to have a good estimate of uh, pavement performance and uh, how do your maintenance and rehabilitation treatments, performing preservation treatments. We don't have environmental impacts of these materials. There is a lot to be done in this area. For NEPA, we think the readiness level is medium low. Uh, 
attribution LCA for the project level would potentially be applicable, but the question is, will LCA give me past specialists what they need? Another thing is that limiting factor is that NEPA is concerned with localized effects. Uh, in our LCA models, uh, we have good idea on these globalized effects, such as uh, green, uh, greenhouse gases or global warming, ozone depletion, but localized effects, we need models that are locally calibrated or refined. Uh, that's in the domain of EPA. There's not much we can do about that. So that's something uh, that kind of is limiting implementation of LCA to inform NEPA. Uh, in payment LCA, uh, we think readiness level is high. Dr. Harvey was involved when we in the Federal Highway uh, Project to uh, establish pavement LCA framework. So we do have LCA framework. Uh, there is many tools right now. Uh, again, we will talk more about that in the upcoming slides about uh, transparency and consistent data. Uh, but we think attributional LCA that's tied to LCCA that's already being done could be a good idea. Again, the data would be a little more specific, state, county, because we know the project we're going to do. So this is the matrix that shows one potential idea uh, on how we can combine LCA and LCCA. So for instance, here, upper, okay, upper left corner, we have alternatives with similar costs and different impacts. Of course, we're going to select one with lower impact. If we have different costs and similar impact, choose the cheaper one. If we have similar costs and similar impact, uh, we can use alternative bidding or additional considerations such as payment type continuity or something else. Uh, tricky thing is when we have different costs and different impact, this upper scenario is unlikely to happen to have low cost, low impact alternative versus high cost, high impact. Uh, of course, low cost, low impact win. But if you have high cost with low impact, so invest a little more and have less impact, or invest a little less and have higher impact, that's when we need to do trade-off analysis or introduce some other hybrid metrics. This is not the holy bible. This is just one idea. Uh, but this is to say that if we want to have multiple criteria to make decisions, we need to have these low charts and matrices and uh, kind of decision-making tools to help us uh, make better decisions. Again, this assumes that we know what does it mean similar, what does it mean different, how similar is similar. In LCCA, it's usually within 10%, but in life cycle assessments, we have multiple impacts. Are all of them equally important? So all of that brings uh, new questions. In bidding, let me skip bidding for now because we'll talk more about that in EPDs and pavement uh, LCA uh, in the second half. Uh, construction is an interesting phase, and we see high readiness level there because construction is when everything happens, and we know exactly uh, we have the best data in construction phase. So that data could be used to supplement uh, as built reporting. Um, and we could collect TPDs, we could collect equipment use, all of the details about the project because we're already developing as built documentation for the DOT. So it's not too big of a stretch to think that, hey, you can just add this environmental portion of it. Uh, challenge here is what are gonna be the systems to collect that data? How do you transfer the data easily? So BIM, building information model, is one potential solution. We'll talk more about that as we go. So here is the scheme, and then we joined every type of LCA with the project phase. And here I'm also showing these green dashed arrows, uh, and that's the data transfer. So basically what happens in the construction when we're certain about everything should be collected for the future, and then it can be used to inform your uh, bidding, project development, step, et cetera. That way you can know what your average pavement design, whatever that means, what your average construction equipment used on the average project, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, this is the idea to use the data from the bottom up and feed it upward. Uh, because these guys in planning, for instance, they don't have precise data, and it has to come from, uh, from the bottom about uh, regarding to what's already been done. Uh, so stakeholders have told us that they don't have good uh, clarity on roles. They're operating in silos sometimes and lim have limited communication. Also that there is a lack of feedback loop. So they see some results, they have results, 
but those results just don't influence any decisions, so nothing happens. Also, they are concerned about consistency of the environmental impact analysis. Are we capturing the full picture? How do we know if we're making savings? Are we, consi are we producing trade-off elsewhere, et cetera? Also, lack of clarity on benchmarks and progress, like are we doing good jobs? Are we doing better jobs? Where are we right now? So all of that is yet to be built and developed. In the future, we will involve with stakeholders from asset management and we'll explore data collection systems such as BIM. Very important thing, facilitating education and just the dialogue between different people. A uh, closer look at EPDs. So uh, that's important for bidding and very specific to the context of California. Uh, that's why we will have a part of presentation devoted just to that. So EPDs are environmental product declarations. That's like a mini LCA for the product. So for instance, if you buy like a granola bar, I mean, you have a bread or I don't know, jam, whatever that is, uh, you are probably accustomed to seeing these nutritional labels that tells you how much protein, how much sugar, how much fat, et cetera. EPDs are the same things for the product. They just tell us environmental impact. So EPDs follow LCA methodology, usually cradle to gate, so just the material production. And they're developed with stakeholder input and they follow a specific set of rules that's called PCR, or product category rules. So PCRs are industry consensus standards that guide how EPDs are developed in hope to make EPDs that are consistent, so that everybody does the same thing, and uh, that are transparent and hopefully comparable. PCRs and EPDs are not required federally. Yes? I'm just curious. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <laughs> Saying what I was going to ask about, like, is there, are there any plans for them to become federally adopted, or are people pushing towards it? Yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, regardless of the fact that we don't have federal requirements right now, and I, I cannot say if it's going to be the case forever, uh, what we have seen, first of all, material manufacturers started making them on their own for the marketing purposes. Uh, another thing was that green rating systems for vertical construction, such as LEAS, for instance, they give credit to people who submit a certain number of EPDs, et cetera. There is more to that story. But that kind of incentivized EPDs partially. So in Europe, some of these initiatives have been started uh, from the top. So basically, these things become required by policy or by legislation, and everybody makes them. In the U.S., it's different, top down. So producers started making them, and then that kind of sparked the interest um, in EPDs. So what happened now is that in California, uh, in 2017, uh, by Clean California Act wa uh, was uh, legislated, and that required EPDs for certain materials to be submitted for all public projects. Uh, right now we have four materials. They are gloss, uh, Steel, structural steel and reinforcement, and mineral wool. That's that? Yes. These are uh, pilots. This is a pilot project, but this will go, uh, next phase will include concrete and asphalt because these are basically what DOT is most, uh, mostly buying. Uh, Caltrans is actually <clears throat> piloting the pavement materials <clears throat> to try and stay ahead of legislation so that we don't need legislation, which is very prescriptive. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, and that's, that's exactly the example of like doing some research or doing some pilot studies just to stay ahead of the curve uh, and not have to be required to do, to do something that doesn't have to be uh, good in all cases. So uh, what they want to do with all these EPDs is to collect them and develop benchmark values for global warming potential. And then once they have those values, uh, they will... Uh, basically in the future only purchase the materials that are below that benchmark. Of course, industry starts sweating immediately when you tell them there is a bar and people have to hop across the bar and your company going to stay stuck. So what about smaller companies? Can they make them? How much money you need to make an EPD? Like all of these issues are now bubbling up because there's many players involved. And recently uh, I was uh, present at a hearing for Washington legislation. Washington has a similar one. Industry was against it 100% uh, because materials are just one component and like why are you separating just materials from the design? You can have the best material and then the worst design. So it's not the whole story. 
yada, yada, yada. Very, very interesting. And like something, oh, this is disfavoring our material. People from wood are going to be advantaged, and these guys are going to be disadvantaged, etc. So there is a battle uh, right now. Many people involved, many people very worried. Uh, what we try to do is to observe this from like technical and organizational perspective. Does this make sense? Uh, and uh, yeah, let's see what we found. Uh, important thing to remember that right now there is no one umbrella and see that's guiding these developments. So each industry is developing their own PCR with their own stakeholders. So there are definitely some inconsistencies. You might, you might define PCR and how that applies to ECB. Yes, I think we had it here. Yes, product category rule. PCR is essentially the document that tells you how exactly are you developing your EP. So all of the rules to develop EPDs are prescribed in PCR. So essentially, if I have concrete plant and John has concrete plant, we both develop EPDs, hopefully we're following the same procedure and we can compare our EPDs and see who is doing better, in theory. That's, that's the idea. Again, if PCR has higher prescriptiveness, it's more likely that John and I will end up doing the same thing and end up with documents that actually can be compared. Uh, Federal Highway is working on documenting best practices because this is becoming a hot subject. Uh, here is a big and complicated graph of my study, but what I'd like you to notice here, and there is a circle here, I don't know if you can see that. So we have these three circles. We are investigating future of EPDs. So EPDs right now are used as communication tools. If you use EPD just as a communication tool, maybe you don't need to care so much about all these technical details. But if you satisfy some of the additional requirements, you're falling into this second circle. EPD can be used as procurement aid if you make sure that all EPDs produced under your PCR are nice and comparable. Third thing, what we'd like to explore is that can we use EPDs as data sources? Can we use them in larger LCA analysis as a little building block? Again, for that, we need PCR harmonization, so this has to be satisfied. Right now, current status, we're using EPDs as communication tools. Uh, there is dashed arrow. We are also trying to use them as procurement aid, but then path forward would be to inform procurement as well as use them as a source of data. I showed this graph already, but this is just to tell you where the data is coming from and who owns the data. That's becoming a very important question. So for material, producer, uh, for material production, this is the industry data. So I have a concrete plant. I take raw materials, process them, manufacture concrete. This is my data. I sell it to the agency. What the agency does with that, I have no idea. So what I can do, I can measure what I do, pack it in an EPD, send it forward. Here is the agency. Again, we're missing construction phase here because this is so simple. But here is the agency. We build a pavement. We're using the pavement, we're patching it, we're milling, we're doing this, we're doing that. End of life, we recycle it. This doesn't have anything to do with me as material producer. So this is owned by the agency. So data transfer happens here. Data exchanges hands. So it's very important to know how is this data being exchanged? Do these people trust each other to give each other data? That's a big question. So. In also, uh, this is an also pavement product system. And this is just to show how EPDs can potentially fit as a little building blocks of larger LCA. So we are starting here with raw material acquisition for aggregate, binder, admixtures, and then we're, these are thick black arrows, that's transportation. We're transporting all of that into asphalt plant, making asphalt mixture, constructing the pavement, use phase, end of life. So in each one of these phases, what I want you to notice is that we have some commonalities. Energy, that's great. To produce anything, we need energy in some shape or form. We need transportation too. And these are our background data sets. So if I make an EPD that is about to be used in larger pavement LCA, the way I calculate my energy and the way agency calculates its energy here better be the same. I mean, you can still develop an LCA with these inconsistencies, it's only your decisions will be questionable. What you get as a result, if you make this hodgepodge, would be much weaker. 
So the idea is to clean it up. So that's why background data is important. Also, these dashed boxes show you where the EPD fits. So EPD is a little module, little part of the larger LC analysis, but we need to make sure that everything that goes into EPD also applies to this larger LCA to keep the consistency. So right now in the US, we have uh, TCRs and EPDs for these materials, cement, slag cement, asphalt, concrete, steel, aggregates. Uh, we'll talk more about cement, asphalt, concrete, and aggregates. We'll mention steel and slag. When we compare those PCRs, I thought everything will be perfect. Of course, that's never the case. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them cover cradle-to-gate analysis. They have the same impact assessment method. They have five mandatory environmental impact categories, global warming, ozone, poten ozone depletion potential, acidification, eutrophication, and smog creation potential. Same cutoff criteria. But here is the thing. There is also differences. For instance, in terms of validity period, uh, all PCRs last for five years. Uh, and concrete, aggregate, cement also say, oh, when you make EPD, it will also last five years. What that means is that EPD outlives the PCR. And then when the new PCR comes, I can come to the bidding with EPD from previous PCR. You can come to EPD, uh, you can come to bidding with EPD from the new PCR. Can we compare them? There are always some changes, so that's all problematic in the bidding context. What asphalt uh, PCR did, they say, oh, when PCR expires, all EPDs expire. End of the story. Nobody has EPD. Uh, which, from the procurement perspective, could be better. Um, allocation is one thing. Uh, we have slag, for instance, that's the byproduct of uh, steel production and is being right now a hot potato pad between these industries. Mm -hmm. So steel people stay on their PCR oh, slag is a co-product. It should have a portion of environmental burden and use system expansion to allocate that. Uh, steel slag aggregate, uh, on aggregate EPD, they say, oh, when you use steel slag as aggregate, use econo economic allocation. It has a portion of burden, but only based on its monetary value. Whereas slag cement say, oh no, this material is waste, it has no burden. We're doing you a favor. So it's there is this inconsistency, so we could double count for the impact or discount some impacts that we kind of don't see. So this is an issue, and these, we need to bring these industries to the room and make them talk to each other. Everybody wants to make their product look good, but if you build a whole system, you are missing out on an important component. So there's also inconsistencies in material and energy inventory. So here we're comparing these different PCRs. So for instance, here, New concrete PCRs doesn't, PCR doesn't require renewable energy. All the other ones require them broken into different pieces. Um, with this one, uh, material inventory, asphalt doesn't require anything except for water. All these other ones require something else. Uh, the thing is, there is no right way to do that, but imagine if you want to digitize this and turn it into a database, how do you c categorize all these things? It's just becoming messy and impractical. This is one that I really like. So concrete, old concrete PCR had all of these optional impact assessment categories. I reviewed multiple EPDs and never found one that reports any optional one. So if something's optional, nobody does it, lessons learned. So the new concrete PCR requires, or actually requires total waste, but they open up a possibility for carbon sequestration in concrete production. It's not exactly specified how to do that, but they kind of opened it up for the future, I guess. None of this is required on the other PCRs. Concrete PCR, old one, uh, recommended background data sources, and we'll see repercussions of that in just a little bit. Asphalt uh, and concrete PCR agree on sources for cement, uh, but for instance, for aggregate, concrete recommends EcoInvent, Asphalt recommends this study by Marceau, which is open source data. There is also a difference. Transportation is the same, USLCI data source, EcoInvent for electricity by concrete, GREED for electricity by asphalt. So there is now this, this difference between proprietary data, such as EcoInvent database, that uh, you, you have to pay for it. Uh, it costs money. So 
the advantage of that is that it's very convenient to use, but it's more expensive on the other end. So if you have public data, that's very good and beneficial. If you don't, <laughs> that's the trouble. We would like to see more people using public data, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we need to have good public data to recommend if we want to recommend that as the best practice. Of course, it provides for transparency, and transparency is very important when it comes to public procurement. So I compared uh, 77 of concrete EPDs. They cover 1,200 mixes, so basically, obviously, more than one uh, mix per EPD. Essentially, the factory produces their whole catalog, and uh, you have more than one. So EPD is not unique product identifier. I cluster them in groups that are made by same facility on the same date using the same background data. And here is the assessment of data quality. So we can see that it varies for different, uh, different flows. But what I'd like you to see here is this dip in geographical and temporal representativeness. This kind of shows us that most of the data that's being used is old and also not, enough, not specific enough for the U.S. A lot of this data is coming from Europe. So this kind of signalizes the need to develop uh, U.S. databases with regular updates that are current and relevant. Uh, here I'm showing different types of data sources. Let's just look into this one. So 40-ish percent of people used uh, Gabby for electricity. 40-ish percent of the people used Equinvent. So now when we know that there is differences in data quality, there's differences in data sources, I get these two EPDs, can I really compare them? Do I really see that these differences are due to differences in production or could that be due to different data quality, due to different data sources? So that's questionable and uh, important to keep in mind. So these things obfuscate the comparability and that's why this should be interpreted with caution. The reason we're analyzing this is because some of these EPDs are still valid. What we would like to see in the future for concrete, for instance, uh, current EPD program is based on ready-mix plants. But when you have paving projects, they usually build a plant on site because ready-mix cannot give them material reliably or fast enough. Uh, also, uh, some tie to performance-based specification and how you define the product. So, for instance, for concrete, we only have compressive strength, which is enough for vertical construction, but when we're paving, we care about tear entrainment, we care about workability, we care about durability. Many of these other things, we don't get that information on EPD. Also, if you see two EPDs, how do you know? Can you compare them or not? How describe your mixture better? Right now, EPDs are static documentation. It's uh, in PDF. Uh, we would like to see them digitized and hopefully integrated with BIM and just being able to transfer between stakeholders a little faster. Uh, in FHWA, we are developing LCA benchmarking tool. Dr. Harvey is on the team. Uh, tool is created with stakeholder input. It will use public background data sets and incorporate material EPDs. Of course, knowing all of these issues, uh, this tool will be like benchmarking tool, more for education, more to get our stakeholders familiarized, hopefully until we clean those issues up a little bit. Uh, we have collaboration with Federal LCA Commons, which is the group of agencies that does LCA. So the sentiment was this one. Hey, if every agency every year pay money, pays money to use some equivalent database or something, can we collect money at once and develop public database for everybody? Uh, with, which with little investment could be maintained, et cetera. So that initiative is already, uh, has already started. The first thing that's coming out of it is the electricity, national electricity data. Uh, next one should be transportation and fuel. So hopefully in a couple of years, we will have this database up and running, and that will lower cost of LCA and make it more available for everybody. Uh, it, will be, it will feed into our PCR considerations, and also next step for our tool is to use OpenLCA and build a tool uh, that will be hooked up to all these uh, open source databases, and it will provide us with regular updates. So agencies, we would like to encourage agencies to get involved with EPDs and uh, compile them, track and communicate uh, environmental goals, and hopefully get enough education so that they can be stakeholders for creating PCRs in the future. So this is a loaded slide, I know. 
Uh, the reason for this slide is because we received some pushback on our idea of harmonizing PCRs. Why do we need to harmonize? It's fine. Uh, if you produce CPDs that are comparable, that's good enough. So, yes, if we don't want to harmonize, we don't have to harmonize. That's fine. Uh, first, if we use EPD's justice communication tool, which is that broadest bubble, uh, we can collect them, we can play with them, and we can just encourage their use and development, et cetera. But sooner or later, producers would like to be acknowledged for their good work and their improvements, so it makes sense to invest a little more effort in comparability so that they can get rewarded when they're doing a better job. And that's coming here. If you improve comparability of EPDs, you can use them to develop benchmarks. You can make those benchmarks stricter. You can use them as a procurement aid to choose better mixtures, just to inform your decisions, but only if they are comparable. Uh, this is all no harmonization scenario, but if we do harmonize them, the whole new world opens up because we can use them as the material portion in pavement LCA. Materials are not the only component. It's how you use those materials. It's how you design your pavement. If you do, do a good job in construction, you can get much better pavement life with material that's not so amazing, for instance. If you, do, if you have a most amazing material, you do a terrible job at construction, doesn't matter. Uh, saving all your materials is like buying very cheap shoes. It's really nice because you don't pay much money, but in a couple of months, you're going to need new shoes. So uh, all of that, like what's more sustainable? So if we can build a whole system and just like involve the industry, which is materials portion, agencies, which is construction and maintenance, federal agencies with background data sets, we can encourage performance improvements on many levels. Lastly, if we have systems that are set up well like this, uh, we can use them to inform policy and green rating systems, for instance, just like make these analysis a little easier, but things will get messier before they get tidier, if you will. And uh, informing policy and just like drawing broader conclusions kind of brings us back to that long range planning, just like closing the full loop. So with that, I'd like to thank you and open up for your questions. And I'm sorry if this was a little longer than it was perfect. supposed to be. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one about the process of, uh, uh, you mentioned process for, uh, that we can consider LCA in planning phase. So, but it was a project, uh, project programming, I think. Mm -hmm. Which one you exactly consider as planning phase, which of the whole thing? Because some of them was construction and uh, bidding and so, which one? Uh, okay, it? so it's these ones, let's just go back, all the way back. So it would be probably, when we say net, no, for the network level, I think, okay. Yes, so for step, we think attributional network level LCA, because in step you already have some projects that are being defined, more or less, like a little more nebulous, uh, but you're observing the whole network. But then for long range planning, you don't have specific projects, you could still benefit from network level LCA as like, as a benchmark, as a business as usual type of thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we thought consequential would be interesting uh, because of the policy. D did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, so you mean mm -hmm. long range plan and the step, yes? Yeah? Yes, but more, yeah, but more on the end of the step, I would say. End of the step. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, my next question was how different is these two consideration? I mean, what, how you want to... Uh, uh, yeah, how you want to consider a difference between uh, uh, considering LCA in these two different process. I see you mentioned consequential and attributional, mm -hmm. but uh, you want to, can you explain more about these two? I mean, you want to yes. consider, yeah. Yes, so in long range planning, uh, basically, I think it's very, it's, it's, things are still, uh, very nebulous and not well defined. Uh -huh. so you say, oh, we want to improve our, I don't know, VMT, for instance, this much, or we have this much 
congestion. We want to re relieve it to this much and like invest $10 million, and I'm, I'm making this up obviously, invest $10 billion to improve congestion from this to this. That's more of like her long range plan. Uh, and if they want to say, oh, our policy from now on is to prioritize projects that are congestion relief, for instance, let's say in LA or in DC, that could be a priority. Uh, you would do consequential LCA to see, oh, if you prioritize these types of projects or if you have a policy on recycled, like use recycled, use 20% wrap no matter what or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we thought would be the best fit there because you don't have uh, you don't have projects like so spe well specified and well defined again if we want to benchmark the whole thing I do think attributional on the network level would be helpful but I think based on uh, the stakeholders we talked about they don't have enough information or enough idea uh, so that I mean, it, it would be a piece of information for them rather than something that's <clears throat> directly uh, touching their decision. And then in steps, you have, you're observing the whole network and you're talking about projects. You're talking about something that's a little more specific. It's like, oh, if I, you know, uh, build another mile on I-90, what do I do with that? How is that going to improve everything? So that's why we thought attributional, but like network-based could be more applicable. Okay, thank you. And Definitely. Sorry, last question. Uh, uh, in terms of details uh, about data, mm -hmm. what's the difference between these two? I mean, you have uh, specific details in your mind for each step or not? So uh, for the first stage, if you do consequential, mm -hmm. it very much depends on what policy are you trying to consider. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. <laughs> That's short, short way to, to answer that. Mm -hmm. For a uh, network level, it could be, so it's, again, what we would like to see is everything being built up from here, everything based on actual projects rather than some hypothesis, but obviously we need to bridge this gap. So for here, for instance, you would probably consider, let's say, an average asphalt mixture on a state level, whatever that means, or on a county level or something like that. So you would have the data that's more aggregated. Um, I think depending on what exactly you are trying to do and what kind of network level analysis, it could be traffic estimates, it could be uh, average paving, pavement, thickness, average design. So it would be somehow uh, aggregated and more uh, less specific, more general. And then if, as you're going down, Phase by phase, when project becomes more clear, you can use more specific data, uh, potentially. Again, this is, I'm, I'm talking a lot about hypothetical scenarios and hypothetical things because this study was more of like, exactly, more, more of like theory and big picture thinking. Uh, it would be very interesting and useful to actually do a network level analysis for an agency and see, and see, um, what 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 are exactly the data needs and like when we get into nitty gritty, what what are all the numbers you must have? And I think I'm afraid that that would kind of limit many of these analyses because they don't have that much data or they don't do too good of a job of keeping the track of everything. We think building systems for data collection is going to be the next big thing for sure. Okay, thank you. Definitely. Yes. I have a question about like. Maybe, maybe, maybe too political for, because <laughs> you were, as you put out there, and my is your employer. But I'm curious about, like, with the current administration really trying to do a lot with NEPA and environmental standards, and if it's affected the types of things that you all can pay attention to and integrate into your process. and. Um, yeah, if you could talk about that, I'm super interested. Yeah, no, we need to go to the bar and then yeah. talk about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding. No, but it's been, uh, I think, so, I mean, this is, it's not a secret that definitely right now uh, what our program uh, has started uh, some time ago, uh, but there, there has definitely been, you know, ebbs and flows uh, regarding to that. Uh, 
for instance, uh, now like bigger focus is on resiliency. And I mean, I don't, it's hard to say, oh, sustainability is more important than resiliency or something like that. Uh, but there is definitely like a little bigger push for that and a little less push for this, but we know that these things are uh, tightly related. Um, I think uh, many initiatives in the state, uh, I think were started uh, because there was no federal uh, leadership in that regard. So we think that maybe pendulum like, you know, swung one way and then it's like, oh no, uh, California is going to do something radical, Minnesota is going to do something radical, so states are uh, becoming more interested. So now in this one, we are more of a follower than a leader, if you will, uh, in, in, this, in this particular uh, situation. What we are trying to do is uh, trying to get ready and uh, develop uh, frameworks. There is a lot of work that still needs to be done, develop a lot of that, and uh, basically uh, kind of push for data-driven decision-making uh, just to help people make better, more informed decisions because I think that's beneficial for everybody regardless of, you know, political <laughs> side of the story, et cetera. So, yes, I, I would hope. just add something to that. Um, that's always federal highways role. It's the federal republic. And there's always a huge divergence of what the different states, but I will mention that Texas DOT and Louisiana DOT have members on the expert task group. They have tasked people to be a part of this. So, and and this also is not just government, but it's also these huge industries, cement industry, huge industry, oil refining, aggregate, construction. These are major constituencies, all of which. So I think this is always the role of Federal Highways is to facilitate communication and try and establish consensus across standards. And some people will kind of be over here farther in this way and some this way, but that's always, it's always, regardless, it's always a somewhat delicate role. Yeah, and also if there is the initiative from the state, if there is initiative from the industry, we have to facilitate that and provide some guidance and provide some um, information for sure. Can I add a thing? Uh, in California, instead of the new color, I think maybe you know better than me, we have uh, CICLA, and yeah, uh, but the, in CICLA, they don't mention anything about LCA. Maybe they evaluate uh, environmental parts with maybe different methods, but not LCA. Any other? Yes. Uh, this it seems like there's a huge like margin in the hypothetical like you know scenario in LCA. How do we like uh, coordinate or cooperate with all the stakeholders to agree and come to a certain point? This is the question. <laughs> <laughs> we bring them to the same room and we. we <laughs> uh, so that's a very good question and very interesting question. Uh, basically hearing everybody's perspective and facilitating the dialogue. I think I can give an example from one thing in our industry that's been very uh, long time conflict is between concrete and asphalt pavements. And I don't know if you're like a pavement person or not, or that's been a clash for sure. And I think it has produced so many good things because once we have these competing sides, uh, they're all pushed to innovate. So we don't want to lose that. Uh, so it's also, uh, I mean, all of them recognize that they eventually have to work together and come to the conclusion uh, and some kind of consensus together. We have a lot of, like a lot of what I'm doing too is uh, facilitating these meetings when you have like stakeholders group and you just get like industry representatives, you get state representatives and you mix them, then you separate them. So a lot of that, uh, a lot of activities from Federal Highways listening, we literally have those listening sessions for this, listening session for that, just bring people in the room and ask them all the questions. And uh, I think uh, depending on the program, depending on the type of the thing, uh, I think the guidance that's being produced should be informed, but not pushed by the stakeholders. So the role of some of these agencies is to listen to many opinions, but then form their own based on everything that's said, 
rather than to have, oh, you know, they lobbied us and they made us do this or that. I don't know if I answered your question. It's been reasonably successful. The first pavement LTA conference was held in Davis in 2010. Mm -hmm. And we had to not invite certain people because it was from the different industries because there was a, a real potential for physical violence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Not kidding. Chest to chest, uh, you know. And now we're going to hold the next one um, this year in Sacramento in June. You're all invited. We're going to be discussing, debating these with industry and the states and federal highways and other countries who are doing this as well, uh, looking at some of the models. But they're all now putting money into the conference together. So it's been a 10-year process, and we've gone from literally ready to punch each other in the nose to <laughs> cooperating and still disagreeing in many cases, but really speaking the same language and trying to arrive at consensus. Yeah, and I think I, I was fortunate to be part of um, some of the pavement design policy peer exchanges, and it's so much fun. When you see them, uh, just like how they argue and like what arguments they're bringing, et cetera, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's great because you learn so much. It's like, oh, yeah, you're preventing us from competing. We should make our material more competitive. It's like, nobody's preventing you. Why don't you do this? It's like, prescribe this. It's like, this is the best. This is the best tool. It's like, not everybody thinks this is the best tool. It's the best tool for you, but not for us. It's so much fun to just like see how things are going around, and but I think it's, it's crucial to have a civilized dialogue and hopefully good things that come out as a result. So, and again, innovation and um, some kind of agreement too. So that's a good question. Sorry. Uh huh. Oh, in, in, the, in the purpose better. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Go ahead. I'm not sure if I made this clear. Like, uh, I'm curious during the year, at the use case, use phase and the payment, is there a way to capture different use phases and what, what type of data is saving in the LTA and the RG? Yes. Yes, that's an excellent question. And that's something that you haven't missed. I didn't include that uh, for the simplicity uh, because we were focused more on materials then. Uh, with DPDs and everything else. Uh, use phase of pavement includes pavement vehicle interaction. So basically, if you're driving on a rougher pavement, you are uh, spending a little more fuel than you would have otherwise. So that's one effect. Second is the influence of pavements on the, on the climate through, you know, radiating heat, uh, leaching different materials, albedo effect. Uh, so there is that component as well. Um, currently, and that's another clash point between concrete and asphalt. Uh, so there have been many models. I, um, I think for vehicle fuel consumption specifically, uh, there have been many models uh, for both materials and for federal highway. Uh, we have a project right now that investigates all these different models because we are not confident enough to recommend one that's going to make everybody happy. Uh, so for now, we're kind of putting it off the table. We're like, hey, guys, but EPDs are a mess. And they're like, we don't care. We want, you know, our pavements are smoother. Our pavements are lighter. Our pavements are this and that. So they want to see that in the tools. They want to see that in practice. We're kind of taking a little step back. So that's coming up. So it's been like a little strategic to like remove that. For now, we say, okay, if you want to compare two pavement alternatives, let's assume their use phase impacts are the same. So we're just going to remove them for now. But you're absolutely right. It has to be included eventually, for sure. John, what was your question? So I had a question, and I want to see, ask a question of the audience first before I ask the question. How many are working on electric vehicles? OK. So one of the trade-offs on electric vehicles and even fuel efficiency standards is that you use you use carbon intensive carbon emissions intensive materials in the vehicle to lighten the fuel use the energy use during the use stage but there's a the potential now that the, the material is being used to make use stage efficient vehicles are starting to actually offset the use stage savings so lots more plastic 
lots more, et cetera, et cetera. And this is becoming an issue. Um, and the so, battery too. Sorry, and the batteries, same thing with the batteries. So right now the use stage is regulated for vehicles, but the vehicle manufacturing stage is not. The CARB is beginning, Professor Sterling told, uh, Sperling told me that they're beginning to think about how do we now start to look at the materials and production stage of the vehicles. So if you could go back to your <laughs> harmonized and non-harmonized scenarios at a pavement and electric vehicle question. Yes. Sorry, this is a little slow. Uh, Here we go. That one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one of the discussions we've been having both in pavement with the Sierra Club who wrote the law about the materials and then we've had this discussion a little bit about vehicles is you've got it listed as produce a benchmark mm -hmm. and then it becomes a go no go specification mm -hmm. emissions are below this I'm good I'm okay to buy I'm on the good sheet yes. if my emissions are above that limit I'm in the bad zone I'm bad you're out and I've advocated that we don't really want a benchmark and a go no go because it's not really saying how much below or above you are. It's just I'm barely good or not. And 100%. you really want to know how much better. And what if you're in a region where no manufacturer is okay with the benchmark just because of regional differences? How do you set that benchmark? So I'd like to get your thoughts on benchmark specifications, which is the way the legislatures in California tended to go and CARB tends to go versus a basically we're going to rate you on your actual number yeah. and whoever's best regardless of where they fall relative to the benchmark. Yes, I 100% I think uh, binary uh, choices uh, like have you hopped across the bar or not uh, are very tricky and industry is extremely nervous about those because as soon as you say what's the number, what's the number, am I better than the number, am I lower than the number, it's kind of produces a lot of stress. I think to your point, uh, definitely uh, giving them some kind of points or some kind of benefit uh, in the bidding process, I think is much better, much more reasonable. Again, how much are they better than the benchmark? Did they just barely pass? How like benchmark also has to have some flexibility because in the LCA, none of this is deterministic. There is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there is uh, also another thing is that, for instance, uh, one more thing we thought about is the follow through. So for instance, you submit a really nice CPD for the bidding. How do I know? <laughs> like what happens if you actually put the material in the structure that's pretty bad? I mean, what if you cheat? What if you cheat? How do you yes, check? yes. And also, I mean, Heather and I discussed that too, uh, how for instance, uh, now, uh, in some industrial engineering, like you're building a power plant or whatever, uh, you are like the only criteria, at, I mean, aside from the price, is how fast can you do the project. So bidders actually uh, bid and say these unrealistically low times, and they're like, it doesn't matter. As long as I get the job, I'll pay the penalties later. So that's how it works on. So that's another thing to think about. I think. Uh, and again, I, I think this could be one, only one component in the decision-making process. I think that's the way I saw it in Netherlands, for instance. They do some kind of like all the environmental impact. They make some kind of score, and then they use that to kind of lower the bidding price for a certain number. And you say for, the, for this project, uh, maximum lowering could be 15%. So if you have these amazing environmental impacts uh, we can reduce your bidding price by 15%. Now it brings us a, it brings up another question: How do you make an equation like that? What are the environmental impacts that are most important, and not? Uh, I don't know. I have many questions and not too many answers, I guess, for this. But it's it's definitely an important perspective for sure. I think there was you had one more question. Uh, uh, just a general question, like. Yes. Uh, looking at your like, presentation, and it says like sustainable payments, and you also mentioned like about sustainability, which is a combination of like you know environmental, social, as well as like you know uh, economic. So on on this PowerPoint, on your presentation, we didn't hear anything about like the social factors. Yes, I said 
at the beginning that it, it was uh, it's one important component uh, not included here. So in sustainable pavements program, only thing that we have that's kind of marginally close to some consideration of social impact are green rating systems. So they have a little bit of that component. I, I was, was going like, to mm -hmm. point that like, the pavement can be a place for like, place making as well. What's that? So, Payments can be a place for placemaking as well. Yeah. Since you're like from Europe, like you know, all the payments in Europe are like for placemaking as well. Like, so I was yeah. like wondering, like Absolutely. you know, how the Department of Transportation like is dealing with that. Visualizes like this sustainable payments program just with like economic as well as environmental factors. Well. Yes. So currently, it's not the part of our program except for that little piece in green rating systems. Uh, What's the name of our tool? Real cost. Real cost, yes. No, real cost is for LCCA. Oh, and, uh, uh, it's called not, in not green dot. The other one, invest, invest, yeah. invest. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm happy I remember before you guys reminded me. So there is that component. Green rating system is just like a giant checklist. You say, oh, I use recycled materials. I use, you know, I made bicycle lanes. I have a bicycle rack. I have this. I have that. And it kind of gives you these gold stars based on that. But isn't that the lead certification? It could, yeah, lead is similar to that. Uh, what we would like to see, and I think that's here to inform green rating system. How did you assign these points? You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you only. And I know John, you mentioned that you couldn't get lead certificate for your lab because you didn't have a bicycle rack or something else. We didn't put in air conditioning, so we couldn't get the points. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Even there, we emit no greenhouse gas, we couldn't get the point for having a sustainable air condition, sustainable air conditioning. So yeah, little things like that can mess up the score, and it doesn't mean uh, they. Uh, we would what we would like to see in the future because green rating systems are easy to use, and people like them. People like getting gold stars. Uh, what we would like to see is that these points should be awarded based on some number, some science, some you know, some LCA maybe. So that's that's that. Uh, one place uh, and uh, the person from here we talked about that for the social component is in planning, for instance. So in planning, uh, equity like social equity is a big consideration. So there is introduction of that social component through the planning. Uh, for pavements, we are still in like nitty gritty, just like what's the thickness, what's this, what's yeah. that. Uh, one thing that could be component of social CA could be, you know, fair wages and like treatment of workers, etc. Uh, but we are not there yet. We, to be honest, we have not done any particular work in social CA, only green rating systems right now for the pavement perspective. Yes. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, when you compare, I think for your, uh, uh, I mean, framework process, you needed to uh, go through different uh, uh, state uh, planning process. Which one was more comprehensive among these six states that you went through? So, uh, I am not sure. They are all very different mm -hmm. because some of them are that future oriented, some of them are needs oriented. But I think, uh, and I don't know, I cannot tell right now for the. So, so there is many of them that have really good elements. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one yeah. is more similar to which one? Which me, one? Sorry. Let me let you guys uh -huh. follow yes. up on that after. Yes. Uh, it's time. So let's uh, thank Elena again. Thank you all for